All right, we are still <clears throat> discussing Cain and Abel in that situation, and uh, I don't know how many go-rounds we'll have, but again, this will be pretty short compared to, say, Abraham or Jacob or Joseph. But <clears throat> um, it is a great introduction with sort of a short story relating to who is the firstborn. And um, I told somebody mm, some time back, they were talking about searching the scriptures on, on you know, this subject, and I said, when I get into the word, it almost doesn't matter where I'm at. I start looking to find out who is the firstborn. And there are certain uh, tells, <laughs> uh, things that give that away. Um, <clears throat> this being a shorter story, it is going to have not as much as we will glean from some of the others, but it has some very, very, very important things. And, um, but again, it's not about learning things from the story. It is about making sure that Cain is not our story. And, and the way you do that is you listen and you receive correction and you, um, you, you keep your heart open. <clears throat> and um, as we shall eventually see, I don't know tonight, um, Cain was fixated, probably just like the elder son was in the prodigal son story. And um, the and, and in the uh, parable of the uh, vineyard, which both that parable and um, this story have the same thing, and that is either anger or jealousy or both or, or more, pride, all sorts of things, um, was the ruling thing when certain subjects came up or certain situations arose, situations that, um, uh, that, challenged, that challenged something in them. Um, and so because of those things, which we will deal with later, and again, I don't know if we'll get to it tonight, because of those certain things, he rose up and he killed his brother, just as the vineyard keepers rose up and killed the heir. And it's, it's interesting <clears throat> that that whole parable of the vineyard is about the firstborn and the inheritance. That's what it's about. That's what the story is about. And Jesus is constantly uh, making reference to that reality um, because it is the reality by which he lives unto the Father. Um, he doesn't just live to the, well, I mean, well, he doesn't just live to the Father as a son. Uh, some time back when I first got into this, I said to you guys, and I said to them in Arizona, I said, <clears throat> and I said to them in uh, Arkansas also, <laughs> that uh, this is not just a matter of God wants Jesus. <clears throat> it's not a matter of God just wants his son. It is that God wants his firstborn son. And um, when we realize what that means, then we can see why Jesus went to the cross, willingly, Amen. for the Father as well as for us. Because um, the issues that lie in the earth right now with God are these issues. Um, and the, the short story or the long story of it is that uh, you remember that two groups came out of Egypt. 
And one was Israel, and they were delivered, and the lamb did not die for them. And that's hard for, that's hard for people to, they would be offended to hear me say that unless they go look in the scriptures and go, oh my God, this is absolutely the truth. They wanted deliverance and God wanted his firstborn. And the first words when God spoke to Moses and the first words out of his mouth before he even left for Egypt was, <clears throat> say, let my son go, my firstborn son. And, and then he proceeds to explain that in terms of sacrifice. Uh, the short version of, of the three things that are brought out there is that there would be a spirit of sacrifice. <clears throat> now, that's hard for some people. Uh, I'll just use an example. Some people have a hard time speaking from their heart. They, they, maybe, I don't know, maybe they're from up north. I don't know. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> but um, they just, it's their whole way is to just speak in terms of things and places and, and this sort of thing. And... Um, so they can, so they do well as a Pharisee, and I'm not saying everybody up north is a Pharisee, just those north of the Mason-Dixon line. I'm just teasing. I'm teasing. <laughs> I'm only joking, <laughs> because I know plenty of people up there and up north, and they are very sweet and open to the Lord. But trying to make a point here, and that point is, is that. We can, we can do that in the Lord. We can pursue the Lord on a certain level <clears throat> and not pursue his heart. And then every time somebody says pursue his heart, we draw up a, a, a picture of what that is. And we do that picture, which is not usually the same thing. It's not going after him in heart. It is, it is still going after him because, you know, I need help or because, um, uh, well, I don't want to get in trouble or because uh, I want to do right or because um, uh, some other reason than just the reason that Mary Bethany came in. Because she knew she was facing a world of hurt going in there. She knew it. <clears throat> How did she get away with it? How did she pull it off, rather? Maybe a better word. She was able to do it because her heart went out to Jesus. And something he had said to her when Martha was working affected her. Affected her. Um, and and it caused her to come back and to come back in a certain tenor, a certain spirit. Um, we can believe that we have a certain tenor, a certain spirit. I mean, I know this has been said, this has been said by many of you here. Um, we've had people in our church that um, can cry at the drop of a hat. And we have said, look, just because you can cry doesn't mean your heart's right or that you really want the Lord, it, you know. <clears throat> and um, there, that, there's a tenor that can guide those tears because clearly Mary Bethany also shed tears because she washed Jesus' feet with them. But how cool that they had a purpose toward Jesus. I mean, you know, I mean, just think about it. My gosh, how can we get that focused that we, we redeem our tears, you know? Because, you know, I mean, the, the scriptures say that, um, that um, this is in the Old Testament, that God will put our, hide our tears and put them in a bottle and remember for remembrance or whatever. 
And there are many responses to that. <laughs> oh my God, you know. God sees my tears and he puts them in a bottle and he goes, woohoo. You know? <laughs> I probably don't do that. I don't know why I did that. <laughs> you know, he goes, <laughs> you know, something very heart moving, you know. <laughs> Deb, did you see what Deb just. Oh my God, I'm going to show this. I am shocked. She took the bottle as if it was Jesus and went like that. <laughs> you, lady, are an abomination to God. And that's why you were crucified. <clears throat> Amen. Um, and they make it some sort of a, oh, it, it, soothes, it gives my soul rest, or da 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 da. And I think God can use that. You know what I mean? I think it depends on where you're at. But it blows my mind that, that Mary Bethany redeemed those tears for Jesus and not for herself. You know, she didn't look at the disciples and go, can't you see I'm crying? How, how come you would beat a Poor girl crying when she's down. Well, she wasn't down. She was lowly. Um, but lowliness um, really has no virtue unless it is either coming from the Christ that is within us or has seen him in a certain way that we all assume we've seen it. So. Everything I'm going to say from here on is worthless. But seeing him in a certain way that, that keeps you and guide, that keeps you and it guides you and it guides your tongue and it guides your thoughts and it guides your criticisms to not be criticisms. But has, has given itself to the Lord in an incredibly, incredible way that allows him, because he's not going to force himself, that allows him dot, 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 whatever. It allows him, you know, I was in my office, I have a, a plaque and it says, you know, all things work together for good to those who love God, those who call according to his purpose. And then it talks about being conformed to his image. Um, there is a way to, <clears throat> for Cain to do this, for the elder son to do this, that everything is working for my good unless something is not considered good by me. <laughs> okay, well that's, what we'd call bad, <laughs> you know, to, to think that, to be there, to not embrace the scripture as it is given, but to um, not transform it, but to pervert it, to twist it, to, to keep us from going into fear or to keep us from going into despair or to keep us from going into whatever, 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 whatever it is, it, that's a crutch and it is meant to save us from Jesus and his work to be able to do whatever he wants. Now, what, now when we say whatever he wants, we're talking about the things necessary to conform us to the image of, of his son. So when we, you know, I mean, I don't know about you. I mean, I remember when I was in Bible school and I'd go up to the altar, you know, and somebody would be praying up there from behind the pulpit, somebody who's been with the Lord for years and I'm new and I'm a hippie and I'm all this stuff. And, I'm, you know, and they're saying, you know, Lord, just do whatever you want with these souls at the altar. And I would go, you can't talk for me, <laughs> you know. I mean, you, you know. It's like, 
because, and here's my, here was my problem. Whatever just looked like random stuff, and it, and it really didn't have anything to do with being conformed to the image of Christ, in my mind I'm talking about. It had everything to do with what I like or don't like. My preferences, my desires, my hopes and dreams. You know. Um, well, you know, the, the journey begins with the cross, with, with our death. Um, you, you, haven't really, you know, the tabernacle, there's a door and you walk in, there's an altar, you up, you know, <laughs> turn right around and walk, walk out. Because that's where the thing begins. And then there's all of this stuff. But if that cross hadn't happened and we, we sneak around it, we come in some other way, then we start playing with the things of God in a perverse way. I mean, and I'm not, the word perverse doesn't, uh, in fact, I think it just means secular. But it's perverse to God in, in the truest sense that we understand. That's perverse to God. Uh, and I'm not talking about secular being bad. I'm talking about uh, offering strange fire, um, which is not a sin, but there is this category of sins. I'm sure I mentioned it in the tabernacle. I've known it forever. Ceremonial uncleanness. And it is the absence of Christ in what we're doing. You know. Well, God, why'd you kill my two sons? I mean, this is, this is Aaron can say, why'd you kill my two sons? I mean, God, you know, we could have got the right fire or something, you know, because we can, our minds, well, why this? And we, you know, and da 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 da. Well, God's very clean cut about his son, more so than he is about sin, because he knew all along after we'd sinned, he knew Jesus, Jesus knew, I'm going to come down there and I'm going to die for their sin. But I'm going to do more than that. I'm not going to just do a job that's good and kind. I am going to be the son that the father wanted. I'm going to be his firstborn. And not only that, but father, I'm going to bring you a whole parcel of firstborns that have my life in them that will give themselves. Sorry about that. It's Texan. Passel means a whole lot. A bunch. So, um, ceremonial uncleanness was was usually visited immediately, whereas people could sin, and you could you could take the time to gather up a lamb and bring it to the altar, and da 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 da, and this kind of stuff. But uh, Nadab and Abihu, bam. Um, so, if we really are priests. And I know you think I'm off the subject here, but I'm not at all. If we are priests, if we are priests, then God is more concerned about ceremonial cleanness or doing it in a right spirit and according to his heart than he is about sins. Now, I can hear one or two of you saying, so does that mean I can sin now? Sure, go ahead. He'll, he'll get you. <laughs> he is a good father. But it's not like ceremonial uncleanness. He's not going to bring a whipping paddle. What'd you put in this? Tears? Okay. So... Um, well, let me just read. As was the case in the parable of Vineyard, in his jealousy, Cain kills God's choice. Oh, my God. See, until you're in tune with the Lord, that, that's not going to affect you hardly at all. But when you kill God's choice, you know, now he's not, see, he's not worried. He wasn't worried about Abel. He wasn't worried about Jesus. He wasn't worried about Stephen. And he wasn't worried about anybody else along the way that gives themselves in this spirit 
but he is worried about those who would, whether ignorantly or knowingly, would attack God's choice and especially to kill it. You know. Cain rose up and slew God's firstborn, but it is okay for it is marvelous in our eyes and in God's. Why? Okay. So I, during the blog yesterday? Yeah. I did the blog yesterday. Uh, I read Hebrews 8, 7 through 10, and I want to read it for you, and I want you to catch something here that that is profound, and it's kind of like the, it's kind of like two groups coming out of Egypt in the sense that it is not caught very often. In fact, I've never heard it caught. <clears throat> this is uh, Hebrews 8, starting in verse 7. For if that first covenant, so it's dealing with the two covenants, right? We all know that because this is Hebrews. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he say. He saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. All right. So... Did you catch the big news there? Um, this is dealing with the two covenants. And it's, it's quoting, you know, I put my law, it's quoting, you know, the big stuff from, you know, Ezekiel 33, is it, and, and 34, whatever it is, and, and Jeremiah 33, whatever. <laughs> I can't remember. But it's the ones that, that are really setting it forth, okay? He's quoting it right here, and he says, I will make a new covenant with them, here it is, not according to the covenant of Israel, not, um, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers, when? In the day in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt. He's not talking about the covenant at Mount Sinai or, or as we understand it. We always place it at Mount Sinai. But Mount Sinai was when the ordinances and the statutes and all of that was given. But in truth, there was a covenant behind the covenant. And that covenant was... Firstborn, I'm going to let a lamb die for you, and you're going to be free to live sacrificially to me by the lamb that you ate, the dead lamb, the selfless lamb that you put on the inside of you. You are going to be able to come out unto me and live sacrificially. Israel, you, the, the, the lamb didn't die for you. It died for the firstborn so that the firstborn wouldn't have to die. You weren't going to die. I was going to send the death angel through this thing, and, the, and it was going to kill the firstborn even of Israel if a lamb didn't die. But it wasn't going to touch you because you're not firstborn. Is this ringing a bell? <laughs> Bring it <laughs> Hallelujah. So he's saying, I made a covenant with you, but this I'm making a new one, and it's not going to be after that old one wherein I had to take you by the hand out of Egypt and through the wilderness because you, the wording, I, and I regarded them not because they continued not in my covenant it's, put, it's pinpointing it when they came out of it. Do, you, do I need to read this? Uh, when, uh, when I took them by the hand, led them out of the land of Egypt. And then he says, because they continued not in my covenant. Okay, so 
He's saying for the firstborn, he's, it's, it's kind of what we saw. He's saying for the firstborn, I'm going to do something different for you now in this new covenant. Instead of assuming that you're going to love me, love Lord God, commandment one, love the Lord thy God. You know, the first commandment is love. In other words, the first thing he's looking for is something from the heart. You know, and he's looking at looking for that from us. And he says, at Sinai, here comes the, the statutes and the commandments and all this. You know, love the Lord thy God. Well, now he's saying, look, I'm not going to take you by the hand anymore. I'm going to put it in your heart. And you're going to want to do this. And you're going to want this. And you're going to love doing this. And it's going to bless you to be sacrificial toward for my glory and for me. I mean, this is this is great. This is this is called good news, <laughs> you know. <clears throat> but the thing that I'm trying to point out here is, just like in in uh, in Exodus. We didn't ever see the two groups came out. And now we don't see that the covenant really started when he was bringing them out. Because you look at the words. I dare you to really look at him. He's saying, I will make a new covenant, not like the old covenant that I made with you. And we all go to Mount Sinai, right? I mean, we should. But he's saying, you're wrong. You haven't. You haven't lined up. You didn't go far enough back. Go back to Egypt. Go back to the lamb. Go back to the eating of the lamb. Go back to the death of the lamb, the, the, the eating of the lamb and putting that inside of you. That was a picture of the new covenant. Amen. <laughs> All right. I know sometimes I seem like a, an insane person. But I, I am full of the matter. I am full of the matter. He is bombarding me and blasting me by opening the scriptures like this and showing me what we've always said was this, and he's saying it's this. He is obliterating any thought that what I have couldn't be changed instantly by a greater view of him, a greater opening of my eyes to see the firstborn and the father's love for the firstborn. Because that's what, that's what these two have been about. And there's more coming. Stuff that we all think and really, really believe that we know this this and the other deal. It all it takes is a reading. The the ones that are all it takes is just read. Just oh my God! You ever see that? But we hear it a certain way, and so we just go with it. Okay, well, you know, is that Mount Sinai? Because that's he talked a lot about the covenant and everything. Well, he didn't talk anything about a covenant in Egypt, but he says right here, I made a covenant with you, and we. We, we uh, uh, what is it, we, we broke the covenant, we, what is it? We cut the covenant with the lamb dying. And that was, in my heart, the beginning of the covenant. And it was also, probably, if you had it done it right, because you, you, you'd continue not, and I regarded them not. Um, if you had have actually got hold of this or asked me, what are we doing and what's the, because he told, now tell your sons, you know, when they ask you, you go, yeah, okay. Well, we're sons, but we're not asking. But if they had have done it right, I don't think we would have need, needed Mount Sinai. 
because the lamb on the inside, you see what I'm saying. I know it's a shadow, but I'm just saying, think about it in terms of that shadow. If, the tr if it was a full, true shadow, that living, dead lamb inside of us would have fulfilled all of those commandments, and that's what he's saying the new covenant is. It's kind of cool. <laughs> it's kind of cool. Praise God. You know, it'll make you free. If you continue in my word. <laughs> so I read it I, twice a month at least. I'm digging in. <laughs> so if anybody's feeling um, condemnation over what I'm sharing, try, try getting some condemnation over not digging in. <laughs> <laughs> Try, how about that? How about fulfill that and then you'll be okay and you won't feel condemnation. Because the next move I'm going to make is I'm going to move into each of your houses <laughs> and greet you in the morning and put you to bed at night and read the scriptures until you're, you, well, yeah. Okay, so um, the giving of a sacrifice that pleased God was not foreign to Abel. Back on Cain and Abel. It was not foreign to Abel. The giving of a sacrifice that pleased God. Okay, that's the firstborn, isn't it? Isn't it? The firstborn gives sacrifice that pleases the Father. Jesus is the firstborn, and Jesus is the firstborn in us. And when we decrease and he increases, when, when, we, when we get rid of that scripture and we start decreasing and letting him increase, then will be fulfilled the scripture. All right, the giving of a sacrifice that pleased God was not foreign to Abel. He knew what God wanted and how or what spirit it was to be offered in. Didn't he? Because God himself said, you know, I found favor in, in your sacrifice and in what you've offered to me. In death... The beloved son, and you remember now, I'm trying to acclimate your ears to realize that the, that the firstborn uh, son is also almost always the beloved son. And I have proof throughout the scriptures. <laughs> okay. So let, let that sink down in your ears because when... When beloved son, for example, when the heavens open, the father speaks and says, this is my beloved son. He's talking about he's going to give himself rightly. This is the, this is the beginning of something that's going to finally get right. Yes. Yes. Does. And it should be on a different basis. It should be. Our relationship should not be on a positional relationship. Now, I will be crucified if anybody reports that I said that to certain people that like killing people. I'm, t I'm joking. But it is not, it is, I mean, yes, there is a, there is a truth in relationship to being in Christ but it is not just a positional thing. It is in union with his spirit and his heart and his nature and his way. Okay? Um, in death, the beloved son would forever be immortalized in the first parents' hearts. Cain, I mean, uh, uh, Adam and Eve. Uh, again, we'll, we'll look at that. Not today, probably, but we will definitely see... I'm... I'm not going to jump ahead, but I'm going to tell you 
this thing takes a major step forward after the, after the death and what God and Eve Anybody remember God and Eve in the first story? All right. Well, they kind of got this thing going. <laughs> All right. I mean, she's no, no stranger either to this stuff. You know, I was writing something today. I don't know. Maybe it's in here, but I was just mm, loving it. I was talking about, oh, what was it? Oh, I can't tell you that. I, I mean, I can, but not now. It's just so good. It's just so good. I'm just telling you. I mean, it's sad that we have to go slow, but you don't know how long I've been going slow to let this drip down from the heart of the Father concerning those drops of his son, blood drops, not anointing. I'm not being anointed. I'm, I'm getting the life that's in the blood. Anyway. So... Um, uh, he knew, let's see, uh, in death, the beloved son would forever be immortalized in the first parent's heart. How much more was this son beloved in his innocent death? Hebrews 11, 4 says, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts, and by it, he being dead yet speaketh. What? What? Did you follow that? Oh my goodness. He knew what to offer God. The lamb. <laughs> right? I mean, in Israel, if you sin, what'd you do? I gotta get a lamb. <laughs> you know, I gotta get me a lamb and I gotta give God what he wants. We go, well, it's a good thing you killed it. Well, we're, we're still only thinking in terms of death. He wants a lamb. He wants the firstborn son. He wants him given for your sin or for the father's joy or whatever because that's the way this, this firstborn is. But we only see this lamb as, you know, here, this will satisfy you because you're going to kill me if you don't, you know, instead of I am like Abel, like Abel. I am bringing you what satisfies your heart. And Lord, please let it stand in place of me. But see, we can see that in sin, but we can't see it in everything. We, we, do you remember how that, oh, somebody tell me, how many, how many lambs did Israel offer up in their history? Anybody know? <laughs> Only God knows. Okay. But the point being is that they were constantly being offered, constantly, constantly, over every issue. So that the father's going, oh, my firstborn, my, my offered, my crucified, my, my beloved son in whom I'm well placed. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Just fill in the heavens with this sweet savor to the Father. So by faith, Abel offered unto God. Okay, so it didn't say God lucked. I mean, Abel lucked out and he offered the right thing. Okay, that's important. <laughs> you know, he knew what he was doing. I remember I made the statement that he was familiar with what pleased God and how to do it in the spirit. In which, well, this says he did it by faith and, and faith is completely different than I'm going to get me a Cadillac or whatever, okay? It is, you know. <clears throat> By which he obtained witness that he was righteous. What We're switching roles now. We started with what he gave, but his faith has done something, not just his offering, because he believed in this way, this spirit, this lamb, this thing other than myself, this firstborn, this beloved, I'm giving him. And so right in the middle of the verse, it switches from talking about what he offered 
to him and him being offered. Right? Right? God testifying of his gifts, and by it, he being dead yet speaketh. His gifts are not confined to what he offered concerning lamb. Excuse me. He understood enough to know my brother is angry. Um, what does God want in this situation from me? What does God want from me? Um, he wants you to slap Cain in the mouth and say, listen here, I'm, uh, I'm now the firstborn and you, here's your problem, buddy boy. You know, no, the thing was, let's, you know, let's go into death. Let's do it, Father. Let me, you know, and, you know, so when it, it's imminent, just like Stephen, I believe, because it yet speaketh. His blood is speaking, and people say, well, his blood's crying out. Well, yeah, but it's, it's speaking to the Father. You know, we always, it's always about sin or what's wrong. Ah, it's crying out. Yes, yeah, he's evil. You know, well, there's something greater than the problems and sin in this world, even this world, anything in this world, anything. <clears throat> and that is that the Father saw in it like Stephen, I mean, and Jesus, I mean, like Stephen, Jesus stood up and went, oh my God, I mean, I can just see him looking over the clouds, as it were, and looking at what the spirit in which he's giving himself. Lay not this to their charge. You know, you say, well, Jesus isn't emotional. He wouldn't jump up and do that. I don't know. I don't, first of all, I don't think it's motivated by emotion. I think it's motivated by nature. It's like, oh, there it is. And the joy of one of the early ones coming in with that spirit in the house. There's hope for the house being built right there. You know what I'm saying? <clears throat> From Cain's viewpoint, with there being no more beloved son, he would again become the firstborn and only begotten son. Well, no, he wouldn't. But he, like, like the parable of the vineyard, he thought, let's get rid of, whether it's kill it or, you know, talk bad about it till it dies, till everybody kills it, would again be the firstborn and the only begotten son. Okay, so he's, he's saying, there's only me and, me and Abel. If I kill him, I'm the only begotten. Three days from everywhere. Sorry, I, I lapse into old brother where art thou. <laughs> um, he assumes that all things will return back to normal where he is again the beloved. But it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. It gets way worse for Cain, right? Yes. <clears throat> All right. But as is the case, even though Bill first born by birth order, he did not prove himself to be the beloved son from God's perspective. <clears throat> okay. Um, all right. I w I'm, we've talked about it already a lot, but I want to cover what I've got here about Abel, Abel's sacrificial death uh, and the spirit of that. And you will see when we get towards the end of the whole story how this thing like a plane lifts off man it just it just takes flight <clears throat> now while it is wonderful that abel brought a lamb in sacrifice yet you are not a true firstborn until you become one yourself okay everybody who's ever been a Offended or hurt or da 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 says, well, I must be a firstborn because I'm going through this or whatever. No, it's not going through. It's not going through. Then everybody is a firstborn because everybody's been offended. Everybody's had unfair treatment. Everybody's had that. 
And if our spirit is, well, this is, this is wrong and this is, you know, and all the junk that we go through that is absolutely not the spirit of the firstborn, we're asking to be left out of any thought of being the firstborn. We're asking for it by continually hearkening to Cain and to the elder son and to Esau and to Joseph's brothers. All of them angry and wanting to murder because it's unfair. In other words, if you are a firstborn, then you are, let's see, yeah. Yeah. In other words, if you are a firstborn, then you are redeemed with the purpose of being given in sacrifice, as is in the example of Exodus chapters all the way through in that first part, but really the whole book. How can we claim we've got the firstborn living in us? I didn't say it wasn't in there. How can we claim that we've got the firstborn living in us when every time a fiery trial comes up, we freak out and, and don't know what it is. We don't know. Well, I'll tell you what it is. It's either an opportunity to show that you are clearly, you are in need of the life of Christ crucified at work in you, in your mind, in your reactions, and in your attitudes. Or it proves that he is in there, you know. I mean, one of the biggest things, one of the biggest proofs that you can have is when you are regularly <laughs> mistreated or done wrong, and the first thing that comes out of you is compassion or prayer or whatever, not compassionate ministry, but, but, but care for them over yourself or falling to your knees, looking up to heaven and saying, Father, thank you. Not my will, but thine be done. And see, you can pray that when you don't know fully everything, but you better know that all, if all things work together and he's trying to conform you to his son, that he didn't allow that unless that's what he's trying to do to you. So you should thank him for it. Just say, you know, not my will because I'd probably go the opposite direction, but I believe. How about that? Can you do that? Can you say, well, right now I can't live it, but thy will be done. And I'm going to be with you instead of complaining over every issue that comes up. I mean, that, folks, that, that includes aches and pains. I hate to say it because I know Carol goes through some terrible stuff, but I pray for you. But it does include all of that. God allows that. You know, and I, you know, I, it's, it's not good to use my example on one front, but on another front, there is a truth that you can gain from it, and that is, I mean, I remember sitting in that chair over there, and I was about gone. I, I was dying, and I was slipping away. My body hurt so bad when I had this hernia thing. It was killing me, and I knew that, that it was, that my life was going to be short now. But the Lord kept telling me, you know, Go to Ireland when, when you're asked. Go do minister in this church. Go here. Go there. And I mean hauling around luggage because you know, I was in many places by myself and all. And, and just sitting in meetings. I remember sitting in meetings in Ireland and, you know, finally Kelly goes, well, we need to pray for him because I probably looked like I was about to die. But now, well, what if, I'm just saying, what if, I'm just using this example and it's not a very good one, so I'm not trying to lift up myself. I want you to see the example. What if the Lord was saying, are you with me or are you with you? And if you're with me, then, then keep going. Well, this hurts. and da, 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 da. Well, I didn't say all that, but I, I did. I just kept going because that's all I know. You understand, I mean, 
you know, you get it after a while, you just know this is what, this is what you do. You just, it, you're the Lord, you know. Well, the example that I just recently used in the blog, was way better than mine, is the fact that, that um, the disciples go out in the boat and Jesus is staying up there and praying and then Jesus comes down and the, the wind is boisterous and the waves are high and they're in the boat and, and so Jesus comes walking on the water, you know, and he, he I'm sorry y'all are getting the same sermon again, some of you, but he, he's coming and they're in the boat and they're going, oh yay, yay, he's coming, he's coming to help us, he's coming to our fears and all oh, this is in this microphone and all of this stuff, you know, <laughs> he's coming to deliver me. And then he stops. He stops over there. So Peter says, can I come to you on the water? And Jesus says, come. So he, he I mean, it's, it, I like the wording about how, and this in Matthew, I like the wording on how he says it, he, he sort of slips out of the boat. You know, when you get out of a boat or anything, you look where your feet are going. But if he looked where his feet is going, he would have sunk immediately, right? He had his focus on Jesus, but then, of course, walked for a while and then went down. Jesus pulled him up. When they got in the boat, the Bible says immediately the storm ceased. It's over. The storm was there for a purpose. The pain was there for a purpose. And when, when I guess when I finished my course on that and maybe Lord willing passed the Lord went okay you know we don't we'll find something else to, to trigger your old nature you know what I mean <laughs> until we get get all that stuff out of you amen so I'm sorry when I, I include but but it really I mean I know this I lived it and I I know being at the worst and I know that, you know, I'm going to be with the Lord the way my heart wants to be with yeah. him. And then when you do that, I believe you can get to a certain point where the Lord goes, okay, storm, cease, what's up? Yeah. You go, what do I do now? Same thing you've been doing. <laughs> Keep going after me. Amen? Amen. Okay, and in our account here in Genesis 4, Abel became as was his offering. He became as his offering. Amen? And that's, that's glorious because that's what we should do. You know? Well, what's our offering? Christ crucified. That was our offering that we offered to God for our sins and for everything else. Well, then let that same lamb that we ate inside of us take over. <clears throat> Abel Abel's is the only story of firstborn sons in Genesis which resulted in death, not exile. Of course, I put except Stephen and many others in the New Testament because you got Stephen, you got Paul, you got you know all these all these ones who were given because they had you had to build the temple, you know, had to build the the habitation. Yeah, you know. <clears throat> Um, it is easy to question that statement unless you believe that God acknowledged him as, talking about Abel, as the firstborn based on sacrifice. Then you will understand that the firstborn was to be prepared for sacrifice even as Jesus was. You have to be prepared or when the, the trial or the suffering comes, you will be, a, a, what is the scripture, what did Paul say? Quit as men. Stop being people and be, let my firstborn go out of you. Come forth. <clears throat> then you will understand that the firstborn was to be prepared for sacrifice, even as Jesus was. Listen again to Hebrews 11:4. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts and by it being dead yet speaketh. It begins by commending Abel's sacrifice but ends by honoring Abel's own death as if it were a sacrifice. And by it he being dead yet speaketh. Remember, God commended his sacrifice and now in this verse also commends his death also. <clears throat> 
And he's not going to do that unless it's a sacrificial death that is after the manner of the firstborn. You know, for us, by Christ, by that firstborn son. If this is true, then two lambs died that day. Now, it actually says that Abel offered lambs, not lamb. But, but if you think of it, if it was one lamb he offered, and then he offered himself, he offered two lambs that day, Abel and his sacrifice. This had to be the case because of the glory of his death, right? The glory of his death. God's glorifying his death. That's, you know. <laughs> Hallelujah. <clears throat> As the newly honored beloved son, his exaltation will last forever. Sure, it is true that from the motives of Cain, Abel died a tragic death, but from, but, but from Abel's motive, he died a sacrificial death. It appears unfair, 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 unfair. I'm a, I will always point that out. It appears unfair that one who had pleased God was unjustly condemned and put to death by his own brother. And yet this is the pattern of true firstborn sons, best exemplified by Jesus on the cross. And it is absolutely clear from the example of Stephen in the book of Acts. So what am I basically saying? I'm saying Stephen was doing all these miracles and all this great work and was feeding the widows and doing all this stuff, man. Such a valuable member to the church. So then we look at that. Can you imagine being one of those who is in the group and you're going, and then they stone him, and he, then he goes, Lord, why would you allow that? Think of all of the things he could have done from this point on. It would have been incredible life and incredible ministry. And the Lord would say, you don't even know my firstborn, do you? You're just all into miracles and power and something happening. Uh, and death, a lot happens. You die. That's it. Good job. <laughs> right? But we want to you know, have all of this and look at all of it and glory in it and everything. Jesus said, except the seed fall on the ground and die, it abides alone. You hadn't done anything. But if it die, much fruit, much fruit. <clears throat> it appears unfair that one who had Please, God was unjustly condemned and put to death by his own brother. And yet, this is the pattern. And it is absolutely clear from the example of Stephen. Why did God not stop this senseless murder and snuffing out of a life so promising like Stephen's? Unfair. I have it in red, so if you're wondering why, uh, uh, every time I... <clears throat> First John 3, 11 through 12. For this is the message. What? He's going to tell us out of chapter 3 what the message is. This is scary. What is he going to say? He could say anything. For this is the message that ye heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil and his brothers were righteous. Or his own works were not accepted by God and and applauded but his brothers were satisfying to the to the Lord no God didn't stop it because it was not a murder but a sacrifice the same with Jesus with Abel we saw God's favor at the altar remember me using that phrase Favor at the altar. Altar favor. Favor at the altar. Wow. You realize that every th everything that Abel did up to that point, that the real favor came at the altar. First, with what he offered and the spirit in which he offered. And second, of what he offered himself and the spirit in which he offered. Many people offer, but Abel not only gained acceptance through the lambs he offered, but he willingly gave himself also. All right, so what, what would it take to, to 
convince our minds that all the offerings that we give that are not through acceptable by Christ Jesus. Now, let me use a New Testament scripture first. All the offerings we give, all the sacrifice we give that are not acceptable by Christ Jesus, not that he's accepting them, but he, they are acceptable by or through him. <clears throat> through the instrumentality is the word there in the Greek. Through the instrumentality of him. What would it take to convince our minds to get us so honed in on this that we're in tune, that we're, we're walking a tightrope with ease with the Lord because we're not, we're not troubled with many things, Martha? What would it take to get us to the, to, you know, because I know that we probably in saying that we probably go, well, I'm almost there. Um, where all of those things, and that's one reason why we defend them and fight and, and argue and, and <coughs> say bad things about people and, and rebel and uh, come up with good ideas. <laughs> See, it's not all bad stuff. <laughs> and come up with great ideas, actually, if it's you to say that. Um, that's why we do that. We do that. We do that. We do that because that's who we are. But we hearken back to, but I remember the time I, see, you're using that to substantiate you when that should have been Christ. You, I mean, does that make sense? You know, and, and I, I also did this, so I'm not as bad. You're better off to be the worst abominable creature that there is and say, Lord, help me. I clearly cannot help myself and I can't, you know, I can't perform what only Christ can and I admit it. And he would go, yay. You all hear that? Uh, and the angels go, yay, one, one soul has, has repented. You know, because that whole thing there comes, you know, the whole story there, that's Luke 15. The whole thing comes to prodigal son and getting the firstborn. So, hey, there's a repentance. Well, that's not the firstborn yet. You know, but apparently you've lost a lamb. You need to go hunt it down. Bring it to the Lord. Bring it back, rejoice. Amen? Amen? Amen. Am I finished? Almost. Look at me. Well, I think that maybe. Oh, yeah, one more sentence. Or is it? Let me reread the next to the last one. Many people offer, but Abel not only gained acceptance through the lambs he offered, but he willingly gave himself also. God's altar favor is not only what brought the favor for Abel, because his altar favor brought him favor with God, right? Well, guess what? There's a part two on that. God's altar favor is not only what brought the favor for Abel, but is what caused his own death. Or somebody's going to get jealous or somebody's going to put it down or say that's not the Lord or I see this or I see that and this guy, all this and you know and pretty soon you talk to enough people and then they'll put that person in a bag and beat them with hammers <laughs> you're saying all right that's old cliff now Randy. I know. <laughs> but but you get the point I mean, isn't, aren't you spiritually beating them, putting them in a bag, tying them up and beating them and asking everyone else to help beat them because of their shortcomings in this area and this area? Well, what if those shortcomings were true, but they were not ceremonial uncleanness? And what if everything that you did or what if everything that Cain did or what if everything that the elder son did 
was all ceremonial uncleanness. Hmm. And, you know, when you start putting your hand to stuff, well, we'll see what happens to Cain. It gets bad. It's better to keep your tongue inside your head there. Don't, don't talk bad about people. Not because we Christians shouldn't talk bad about people. If, no, if for no other reason than when you manifest it, you, you will pay the uttermost farthing. All right, let's pray. Oh, wait a minute. Let's not pray yet. Let's cast out demons. Actually, I don't guess we're quite ready for that. Well, okay, let's just be honest for a second. How many of you would think it would, might be a good idea someday that we just deal with some demons in people? Okay, okay. we can do that. Jim? <laughs> you said, did you see us? <laughs> you can stop the stuff now, but I just remembered the.